Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. And I would like to talk about the Queer Archive Institute, but first uh, I will start <coughs> with a little introduction how I get involved in archives and so on. So in 2005, uh, as a visual artist, I created the exhibition called Fags that was considered the first openly gay exhibition in Poland. And uh, I'm mentioning that because it's showing how, how short the queer history he is here and also how much uh, we, we, I, I thought we need to, it need to be done yet. And 2005 was also the year that I started to run my uh, publication that is still going on, uh, Dick Fagazine. It's an um, art magazine focused on um, masculinity and homosexuality in Central and Eastern Europe. At the beginning, it was more like a small zine. Not small, but more like a zine covering the contemporary Poland and um, <coughs> neighbor countries, but uh, focusing on the contemporary issues. And then I started in 2009, and it was published in 2011. I started to work on the issue called Before 89. The idea was to make a research and trip to as, as many as possible countries of Central Eastern Europe to collect the information about so-called queer ancestors to build this uh, history or reconstruct it in a way. So I visited a few, few countries and uh, each topic was represented by one. Uh, they were interviews, uh, archival photos from the private collections from Romania, Serbia, um, uh, Czech Republic, and uh, diff different aspects like cruising spots or, <coughs> sorry, something with my foot. And um, if, for example, Douglas Cream visit to, <coughs> to Prague in the 80s and all the um, connections that were between the countries, this is Serbia. And because of the research started to be presented also in a way of uh, installations and the archive started to growing. Uh, it was the beginning of general idea to how to start uh, something bigger than just a magazine. Uh, in 2009 also when I started to work on that particular issue, I started to work on the long-term project called Kishaland, that is a kind of a core for the whole Queer Archive Institute activity. Um, I met Richard Kishel in 2009 and I, I was just uh, interviewing him about his um, magazine Philo. Richard Kishel is an amateur activist, uh, amateur artist, like not considering himself as an artist, living in Gdańsk. It's a north part of Poland, the harbor. Uh, I'm mentioning that because it was also important for that activity of this magazine. So the magazine called Philo, actually Zine, was first or one of the first queer publications in this part of Europe. Started in 1986. Here you can see some mock-ups and uh, the editorial team of Philo and the parties that they were organizing. It was a kind of the first proto-queer community in Poland, I would say. The Kishel was also a photo amateur um, portraying his boyfriend. This is his flat that is living archive that uh, we're constantly working on. So I'm visiting him and uh, I'll show you uh, uh, later how, how I work with his archive, but uh, this is um, the space that there's a lot of, in, in, as always in this kind of place, a lot of trash, but also a lot of very pre precious stuff mixed together. And Richard Kisha, is, he's still alive, he's 70. In the 80s, he cre at the end of 70s, the beginning of 80s, he creates something like a fake guiding book because he was working in a printing house, so he was managed to make this, not a book, but a notebook called Polish Gay Guide on the European Socialist Countries. And he was basically traveling across uh, cent uh, Central and East Europe and also Poland, taking notes, particular notes about some countries, cities, uh, re regarding the queer life in the past, uh, about uh, saunas, uh, cruising spots, toilets, with the information about the opening hours, about the prices for, for the towels and so on, like a very practical guide. Also, at the same time, he was collecting photographs of the places like the clubs photographing from the outside. There 
There is a unique collection of the photographs documenting the places in a way that nobody did because even if from Prague we have beautiful photos from the inside, like T Club, uh, we they never considered to take a photo outside. But he was like a queer tourist, so he make all topography of these places. And now I'm working on an exhibition opening next week, focusing only on his cruising tra trips, mostly in Poland. He covered 24 cities in Poland, visiting by train and taking the photographs of all these queer spots. So it's like uh, 400. Uh, uh, s um, photographs. Uh, it's, I have to mention for the context uh, the Operation Hyacent that we could consider somehow Polish Stonewall or what I would like to say that I'm basically what I'm doing I'm trying to search for different narration different to the Western North American uh, events uh, language and um, chronology uh, defining the queer culture. So Operation Hyacinth was the police action against homosexuals uh, ho um, in Poland from 85 to 87, but there were particular days selected by the police. Uh, so they started in November 15, 15 of November 1985. Basically they were, for two days, they were coming for some offices, flats to the, of the people. Uh, gay people and trying to blackmail them, collecting the data. So it calls like ping files. They they collected around eleven thousands of files. Probably it's it's not accessible. It's spread out through some police uh, uh, archives. But um, I'm mentioning that because it was like a crucial event also to queer community in Poland to recognize themselves as a community as. Uh, gays, although they were not using this word, that's why I'm using word queer in that context. But uh, mm, many of the, and it was also, the, 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 the police announced and the ministry that they want to protect gay people from robbery and, and also the AIDS crisis just started but was not that heavy issue in Poland at that time yet. But uh, they also used this to blackmail um, uh, gay people to force them to work for the secret service police, some of them. And uh, so it was a very traumatic event, but um, Richard Kishel, he claimed uh, in, my, in the interviews that uh, he said, if police make a coming out for me, now I'm free, I don't have to be afraid of anything, so I started to be just open and do whatever I want. So he started this film magazine, but also, he started this uh, photo series of uh, color slides. Uh, it's, a, it's a private event hosted in one of the flats of his friends. Basically for two months they were taking series of photographs, color photographs, positive slides, um, playing with props, with some ideas, kind of in, we could consider it into the camera performances. Also the slides were organized in a sections like a frame by frame Films. They didn't have a camera, so they said they used the slides as a kind of animation. And it was never presented, never published, just once in a private flat. So it was totally private activity run, uh, made by amateurs. Uh, I'm showing this also, that it's a crucial discovery for me and for my archive, because this kind of Mm, art, photographies, or this t topic were, were, were not present in any mm, artistic activities, in any uh, even in Polish culture, there, it was not present. And some of them, of course, remind of some um, Western um, films or photographs like Rocky Horror Picture Show, although Richard Kishel claims that, that, that at that time, he and they, his friends, they didn't know about it. And they were just creating their own visions, especially Kishel, he was kind of directing the sessions. There were also this few uh, series rela re related to AIDS, when he's, he's dressed as an Indian shaman to make a kind of a voodoo um, rituals against the AIDS crisis. I created a whole film, uh, half an hour documentary, that is based on the interview with Richard Kishel and he's telling the whole story, but also doing kind of a reenactment of the sessions from the, from the 80s with the, with the model and some props, costumes. But uh, I, I, I wanna sh I'm not gonna go in details with all the works I will be presenting just to give you an idea how all this um, works in my case. Um, so, and one of the examples to show you also why and how as an artist I work with that archive, 
uh, is Robert, you probably know Robert Indiana Love. He just passed away a few weeks ago or two weeks ago. His love transformed by general idea uh, into AIDS. In the AIDS is one of the crucial, iconic works related to the queer culture and also AIDS crisis um, in so-called Western world. And I found a uh, collage in the mock-ups of Philozine, because Philo was black and white, Xerox, but in one of them there was a color um, as, um, collage made with these cheap st stickers, our Eastern European pop art version, uh, with the alphabet. So Kishel made this collage with AIDS and Donald Duck. And I thought that it was just an illustration for the article, but this idea of kind of distance and irony regarding the AIDS crisis was kind of in a dialogue for me with general idea project. So what I did as an artist, I uh, kind of transformed this logo and create a series of works that are both uh, reflecting to Western canon of the queer art and also uh, archival material from Eastern Europe. And there are some exhibitions, so you could see how I, how I work on that. There is a series of graphics, paintings, the wallpaper. Here you can see even the original piece of the general idea wallpaper incorporated in the uh, installation. Uh, sometimes on the exhibition you see the original photographs of Richard Kischel mixed with my own works. The whole project is called Kischelan and we are collaborating together. Yeah, there are different um, exhibitions. And uh, I also started to experimenting with the series of performances when I'm incorporating uh, kind of the spirit of Kischel from the 80s. Here with my colleague from Italy, uh, we are performing uh, dressed in the make makeups and costumes from the photos of Richard Kischel, but it's mixed with the, some Brazilian rituals, but I'm not also gonna go with the details just to show you the performative ways that I'm uh, when I'm creating the works based on this uh, research and this archive, his Philo magazine and my Dick Fagazine publication. And that's how uh, the whole Queer Archive Institute started, because this uh, archive was growing, there were more and more photos and informations. The interviews that I was doing for the magazine started to take form also of the video oral histories. So I decided to start kind of para-institution, a bit like uh, Wukash was describing. It's also performative institutions because as I don't have one space, it's a pop-up space. It's a pop-up uh, institution. And I was uh, thinking to myself, how this, what would be the focus of the institution? It would be just Poland or Central Europe, Central Eastern Europe. But then I thought uh, if I would be American, I would do this just global. So I just decided to make a global Queer Archive Institute, but the idea is that it's concentrated mostly on the so-called peripheric countries, which in includes also uh, South American countries, and the uh, inaugurational show of the Queer Archive Institute was in Sao Paulo, in Brazil. I used this strategy that I continue to explore. Uh, so Video Brazil invited me for the, for the residency and the research, but I used this time to also do my own research with the queer archives, and I opened the institution in the institution as an exhibition. Here you can see the logo, some uh, oral histories uh, recorded in the form of the um, videos. Also some videos from the collection of Video Brazil that become part of my collection for temporary period of three months. Also, the, that first show was the sketch of how I want to, in the future, this is a bit referring to what we, you were uh, talking also yesterday, how, about the dig digitalization and also how the keywords could work and how to organize the material, make it accessible for the people. So the, in this analog form, the tables were ser uh, serve as a sketch for the future keywords of the website, uh, organized around some particular topic like AIDS, but uh, I was combining materials from uh, from Brazil and from uh, Central Eastern Europe, like Czech, Poland. Here you can see the table when I'm presenting the first pages of the first ever queer publications that appear in particular countries. And then you have the dates, the first a gay mag a queer magazine from the Czechos Czech, Czech Republic was in 1932, then Belarus is 1998, Poland 1986, and uh, the uh, queer zines made by transvestites in Rio de Janeiro, they were from 60s, so all of them were m creating kind of a map of the juxtaposed regions. Uh, yeah, I'm not <laughs> going to describe all of them, but uh, different issues of, of gender and um, lesbian culture and the issue of race. 
Um, then I was invited to Belarus in Minsk, and I, it was the second exhibition that I did at the Queer Archive Institute. And this is a kind of working station when I'm presenting my research and archives juxtaposed with my contemporary photos that I create when I was visiting the country. But also I invite local artists to create together the whole exhibition, so there, there were a lot of works just uh, commissioned for that show, commenting. It was also considered like one of the first queer exhibitions in Belarus. Uh, my magazine was always, always present and uh, it's, as I said, it's a bit like a working station, so I'm constantly gathering materials, I'm present, and I'm also running a series of events, lectures and workshops when I'm there. It's one of the works, but I also skipped because it would be not enough time, I think, for everything. The, the, this, but the series of works and uh, archives is constantly traveling. For example, the research that I did in Belarus was presented in Kyiv, in Ukraine, in the form of the city lights, but also in exhibition. The other example, how the institution is work, when I was invited by Zagreb uh, Contemporary Museum, to queer their collection, and it was really hard to find any good examples how to uh, of the queer art in that collection. Then I saw the building is pretty crazy and weird, so I just occupy one of the spaces that everybody pretend that they not exist, not a storage, not a part of the collection, and I organized the office of Queer Archive Institute running in the opening hours of the museum. So we, we basically were working with a uh, graphic designer on the um, publication because I was for one month at the residency also trying to investigate some stories related to the queer topics in the Croatia. Also um, uh, work with Leonida, she's present here. So she was very helpful and uh, was part of that uh, research. And the performance was uh, just uh, kind of break in the in the research but the final um, people could uh, visit me and I was talking also about the collection about the foundings but then the the crucial part was the kind of a book but the publication in the form of the issue of Dick Ferguson because since I started Queer Archive Institute in 2015 and the Dick Ferguson was run before the Queer Archive Institute become a publisher of the official publisher of the Dick Ferguson and this is the issue uh, like a kind of best of summarizing different um, uh, texts from different countries that I uh, put together. It's also in English and French because it was um, commissioned for the um, conference in Paris, in Sorbonne, and I heard that if I will not translate it into French, the French academics will not quote me, so we did it both English and French, and uh, it's quite uh, the covering almost the whole region with selected texts. An example how I work with Queer Archive Institute, the exhibition in Amsterdam, uh, commemorating 100 years of October Revolution. I pick up some um, um, stuff from the collection of Queer Archive Institute and form kind of a timeline going from 1917 to 2017. Uh, this is the last issue dedicated to Belarus of the magazine. And, uh, I re recently also started to, beside Brazil, I started to collaborate with Colombia, although I never been there, but my friends in Bogota started the research, and um, they used the strategy of Queer Archive Institute to make a research and to create the exhibition. Um, you could see the eight wall paper because there were few stuff related to Central Eastern Europe and my, my, my archive, but basically the whole exhibition was dedicated to uh, Queer Archives of Colombia. And they, they used the logo and the format of the exhibition, but there were also some performance queer anarchists invited to activate, perform the archives in, in the space because the exhibition was running more than a month. Um, and, it, and this collaboration is extended now, and I'm planning the special uh, Dick Fagas and issues uh, about Brazil and about Colombia because there is so much material collected already. And uh, how much time do we have? Like a few minutes? Six. Six minutes, okay. So I also want to um, show you the exhibition that I curate uh, with my colleagues uh, last year. I'm in Warsaw, I'm running, uh, I'm co-running. It's, it's, it's a group of people, the uh, queer festival called Pomada. Last year there was seventh edition. And uh, we create the show called The Heritage. It was the direct uh, political response for the 
um, our government nationalist propaganda and the way they want to also present art uh, in the public institutions. So last year, the National Museum in Krakow was presenting the show uh, titled Hashtag heritage to be more cool and to get the young audience but basically it was a super conservative boring huge exhibition with the objects from the past trying to build this narration of white polish nationalist supremacy so <clears throat> in response to that we create the show the heritage very conventional we rent the space in the this huge palace of culture and science. The room that's supposed to be, uh, like in the past it was a library, but uh, now it's empty and uh, possible to just rent it. And the show was like a sketch. There were a few hundreds of objects, contemporary art, but mostly the archival materials that uh, were covering the whole, the whole Polish history of uh, the queerness, the present of queerness in the Polish history. We are starting from Polish kings, going through the writers, poets, uh, uh, doctors, uh, all LGBTQ aspects of life since the Middle Ages, if we could manage to find something. Uh, there were a lot of objects also from contemporary times, from the clubs, like some memories, uh, some personal uh, souvenirs from the from particular people or from the families of the writers or culture figures. And the whole exhibition, as I said, it was designed as a huge sketch for the big show or for the series of exhibitions that could be developed with, um, in, in a frame of the Queer Archive Institute, um, what we are planning and doing. And it was also collaborative work of the people who were searching like theater and different aspects of the culture events. Uh, I could continue because there is a lot of projects and stuff, but here is the website. It's at the beginning. Uh, now it's just a short information about the events that I'm doing, how I'm traveling and what is happening. In the future, it will be huge digitalized database, but I don't have money for that because I also have to mention that Queer Archive Institute is totally independent, non-profit, not registered organization uh, run by me so far with the collaboration of the people in particular countries who are involved. But you could check what is uh, coming next. Actually, the next it's this next week, uh, the um, exhibition in Gdańsk in the City Gallery dedicated to cruising, presenting part of the Ryszard Kishas archive. Um, but I'm happy that uh, I'm invited in that context of that conference because uh, I think it's also subversive and political to talk about the uh, amateurs who are queers and they f uh, feel the lack of the presence of that kind of topics in high art or Polish art and culture in general because that's the statement of Kuyakaf Institute, how I could subverse, rewrite, appendice and uh, yeah, change the Polish queer history, uh, queer history and general Polish culture history through the Queer Archives Institute's activities. Thank you.